It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the corner of 5th and William, comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk about comics, making comics, comics lifestyle, self-publishing comics, and publishing comics, because this week my guest, uh, uh, this lady, graciously agreed to sit with me and talk about comics and publishing comics. We've got Gina Gagliano on the show of First Second Books firstsecondbooks.com. Hi, Gina. Hey. Thank you for being here. Now, you know, I mean, we met, what, two, three years ago at SPX, I think, and I said it then, and I've said it many times since, is that uh, First Second Books is, in my opinion, the Pixar of comics publishing right now, because you guys do not print a stinker, ever. Everything you've ever put out in print, even if it's something that's not my taste, I look at it and go, no, but it's really, really good. Uh, so I'm, I'm really glad to have you here, first of all, is what I want to say. But secondly, this is where I want to lead off, is, uh, oh my gosh, how do you guys pull that off? What is the culture of this place where, because no other book publishers in comics are doing this, in my opinion. Nobody's got like such, such consistently good material with such a wide variety of stuff. I'm wondering if you could characterize the culture there and how, that, how you guys managed to make this happen. Okay, well, I think that we have... Um a lot of things going for us, which is why we're able to do this. Um, one of them is we have a great, really creative editorial director in Mark Siegel, and he founded our company six years ago, and he is just really wonderful and knowledgeable, not only about the U.S. comic scene, but about the European comic scene as well, and he grew up in France, so he has a really deep understanding of their culture and also is just personally friends with a lot of the creators over there. So he's really able to bring an, an international sensibility to our company. Um, so that, that's one of the reasons. Another reason that we uh, publish really good books is that there are four of us who work here. Um, Mark, our editorial director and founder, Callista Brill, who's our senior editor, Colleen A. Venable, who's our designer, and me, and I do the marketing and publicity for First Second. And because there are only four of us, and because comics tend to take about three years to do a you know one to two hundred page graphic novel from creators starting on it to us publishing it, um, we try not to spend our time publishing books that we don't think are really good because that's just too long and too much work, and you don't have like interns or assistants or you know, people we don't like who work for us that we can kind of like bob off the difficult stuff that we don't want to be doing on. So, so we really have to be dedicated to the projects that we're, we're publishing. Um, and then I think the, the next reason is just that our parent company is this company called Macmillan. And they're great. They're the sixth largest publisher in the United States. And they publish Tor, they publish for us, Joust and Drew. They publish Scientific American, they publish Henry Holt, they publish St. Martin's, they publish um, the Macmillan Children's Group, which includes uh, Fywell and Friends and Square Fish and a whole lot of other publishers like Pretty. And they also distribute a lot of people like Drawn and Quarterly and Paper Cuts and then also some other non-comics publishers. Um, so with the resources that they are able to give us, we're able to pay the creators that we like advances and royalties on their books so that they're able to spend time and dedicate their their years of their life to working on graphic novels for us. I, I guess that makes a big difference is that uh, you're talking about actually making graphic novels as opposed to the traditional, when I say traditional, I mean like going back 50 years. Yeah, the way comics. What's that? Like pamphlet comics. Yeah, the pamphlet or floppies, whatever you want to call them, where it was like, let's crank this thing out in a month. Now, some amazing stuff was produced under those kinds of strict uh, restraints, right? Definitely. But, yeah, but, definitely. but also, you have a lot of stuff that becomes potboiler stuff as they're just cranking it out, like the pulps kind of thing, right? And just like the pulps, you can have some amazing pulps. And then, uh, some, but anyway, so, so that, that's interesting that you're talking about having a, a smaller team means that you have to be a lot more judicious about where you put, uh, put your resources, right? Or yeah, and I mean, another thing besides that, if, you know, when we're talking about potboilers, is that we really believe in the editorial process here where when a creator signs up a book with us, we sit down with them before we sign the contract and we say, you know, we expect this to be a partnership. We are 
publishing this book and we want it to be the best book that you can make. And we are going to work with you to make it be the best book that you can make. And that might, that's, you know, definitely going to involve revisions. Um, when our editor edits a book, she tends to do about three script revisions and then three art revisions for every book that we publish. So, you know, that's, you know, wow. someone sends her, the, the artist sends her that script or that those thumbnails or those inks. And she says, okay, I'm going to go look at this entire book and I'm going to give you notes on the entire thing. And you're going to have to make some changes. And, you know, it's not like we're like, oh, look, we got the colors. You need to redraw 50% of the book. <laughs> But it's definitely, we make it clear to people when they sign up for, with us, it's a continual process where at every stage we are trying to give constructive input so we can all make this book a book that we're really proud of. So that's actually probably the biggest reason that we uh, publish books that you think are, are the Pixar of comics. <laughs> uh, now, you're, you're heading into an area where I wanted to go. We're going to talk about your, the blog that you write for on the First Second website. But just, just in case, you know, I, I didn't do my due diligence here. And actually, for those who haven't read anything for First Second yet, check out this pedigree, everybody. Laika by Nick Abadzis. Uh The Fate of the Artist, Eddie Campbell. Uh, Vampire Love by Johann Sfar. Three Shadows, Cyril Pedrosa. Coco Be Good, Jen Wang. All of these books are amazing. The Eternal Smile by Gene Yang and Derek Kirk Kim. Feynman by Jim Adiviani, who's been on the show before. Tune, Level Up, Anya's Ghost, Broxo, Zeta the Space Girl, Astronaut Academy, Sardi in Outer Space. All amazing books. And yeah, we will put links to these in the show notes. If you, if you haven't read these and you like comics, uh, you will read these and you will love comics. Um, but yeah, so you write this blog and you've been posting about this process that you've been, this editorial process and acquisitions process. This is the behind the scenes blog that you've been doing on the first second website. Um, what was what was the I mean, you know, what was the genesis behind opening up the, the back door and letting people look in like this? Well, you know, we, we are only four people and we spend um, the majority of the time that we're not asleep at work. And so we felt like the internet is a good place to get people to know who we are and what we're doing, which is what we're using our blog and our Twitter account to, to try to um, get to. So, you know, sometimes you'll be hearing about the acquisitions process on our blog, and sometimes you'll be hearing about, like, things we'll have for lunch on our Twitter account. Um, but, I mean, also, we just find that when people are more informed, they uh, make better decisions. So having the information out there in a really accessible way is, is, is optimal for all of us because then when authors are working with us, when they're thinking about signing up with us, if they have a resource where they can say, what am I getting myself into before they get it into it, yeah. um, then they'll be more prepared for dealing with the process as it goes along. Um, there's also a blog that I have been really inspired by. It's not updating right now, but um, it, it's really great. It's called the Editorial Anonymous, and it does the sort of thing from an editorial perspective instead of from my marketing perspective for children's publishing instead of comics publishing. Um, and it's really great and funny, and if people are interested in writing children's books, I recommend that they go read all their archives before submitting anything to anyone. But this kind of flies in the face of the traditional notion of marketing and branding, doesn't it? Where you, uh, you know, it used to be that you want to be a symbol, you want to be the Pepsi logo, and it becomes this implacable, faceless brand that people associate with, rather than, oh, that's like when 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 I'm talking with First Second on Twitter, which is zero one First Second, uh, is the handle. Uh, I know I'm talking with you, right? You're you're humanizing it. Doesn't that actually damage your brand in some way? I think um, a whole lot, pe a whole lot more people work for Pepsi than work for First Second. <laughs> um, I, I feel like that that you know strange, implacable, you know sugary soda goodness sports is not something that we're ever going to really be able to match in terms of staff and resources. So on the on the other end of it, uh, on the other end of that social marketing scale really the only thing to do is to show people who you are instead of just being mysterious. Like if you're too mysterious, people aren't going to be able to find you at all. Right. 
And it's also about working with what you got. I mean, the, you've already been, uh, I'm detecting a theme here is that limited resources, so we work with what we have to achieve maximum results, right? Indeed. Uh, I mean, when I say limited resources, we do have limited resources, but limited time. everyone has limited resources. Of course, of course, yeah. I mean, I'm not talking about like, you know, we have a shoestring to do marketing on, yeah. and it's actually a shoestring and not like, metaphorical <laughs> shoestring you know we do we do have a marketing budget we have an editorial budget we you know our lights go on every day we have computers that work and we have like we even have some stuff that's like proofing printers which gives us in our office it gives us color accurate proofs of things that we do like we have we have all these resources behind us um, we just want to maximize them with the, the staff that we have. Right. Yeah. When I say limited resources, I was mostly referring to there's only 24 hours a day and four people. That comes to 90 something hours a day that gets to be put into this work. Right. So it's 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 a person hour thing, not a, uh, a, a physical or monetary resource thing that I was referring to. Uh, but going back to some of the things you're talking about editorially. So you say that like you guys are involved uh, in the process of making the book over the several years that it gets made. Uh, so am I to understand that this means that you're saying like, Hey, you know what? Um, monkeys are really marketable. So, you know, your comic about kids at summer camp really needs a monkey in there. Put a monkey in there. It'll sell better. Is that the kind of stuff that you guys are doing with your authors? That is not really the kind of editorial <laughs> process that we um, go by here at first second. Um, when we, when we acquire a book, we, we get a lot of uh, different things when we acquire a book. Like sometimes we get a full thumbnail script, sometimes we get a full script, sometimes we get a, you know, a plot summary plus some pages of art. Sometimes we just get a plot summary and we match up an artist with, uh, with the writer who submitted the plot summary and his his or her past work. Um, but we basically know what we're getting into. Like if someone's like, you know, I'm submitting to you Brain Camp, which is a book we published by Susan Kim and Lawrence Clavin with Art by Faith Aaron Hicks, and it's wonderful. Um, and it's, it's a summer camp story about aliens and uh, parents wanting too much from their kids. Uh, we, we know at the beginning that we're getting a summer camp story with aliens and parents wanting too much from their kids. We're not like, you know what? But I think that this is going to be a, you know, Mariko and Jillian Tamaki sort of like teenage angst meditation on life like Skim was. We should probably take those aliens out because we, we were forewarned about them. Like that's the book that we acquired. Um, and of course, sometimes artists, you know, will submit us a book and then their idea of what they want to do changes. And we, you know, work with them to make sure that the new direction is still the best way that the book that they're writing can go. Um, but, but if someone, if someone submits us a, you know, teen coming of age nor story, we're not going to say, okay, all of a sudden this needs to be a, you know, space aliens hijinks adventure. If that's not what the author wants it to be, we make it the best teen coming of age story that we could. So in, in, it's about taking what the author's initial uh, vision statement was and sort of uh, being, their, being Jiminy Cricket to say, is, you know, this thing that you're doing here doesn't sound like what you said you wanted to do. Is that what you wanted to do? Did you want, is, is that the kind of discussions that you have with your authors then? Yeah, or, and stuff like that, but also stuff like, um, you know, like your character seems really out of sync in this second scene from what they are in the rest of the book. Or, um, you know, why, why is the brother such an important character and not involved in the conclusion of how the book comes together? Or, you know, the, the space aliens feel a little, you know, deus ex machina at the end. Maybe we should integrate them more in the beginning with some foreshadowing or, you know, any of the stuff that's basically taking a look at the book and saying, like, these parts seem not to be working as well as they could be. Mm -hmm. So helping refine the story rather than uh, well, writing or yeah, yeah. saying the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, and that's, that's what people, again, going back to my Pixar metaphor, that's what people attribute to Pixar is that they supposedly have a sign over one of the doors that says uh, story comes first or story is king or something like that, right? Uh, what's, what's the story? We, we feel that way as well. 
Well, in the books that you guys wind up publishing, I think that that uh, ethos is there in in the authors and obviously in the edit editorial team as well. But now, so okay, we're talking about some behind the scenes stuff, and that is the big idea of today's discussion. And I want people, to, I want to point people at the uh, first second books blog, uh, the behind the scenes blog that you've been posting, because you've been posting about a lot of stuff, like like the acquisitions process. That was really enlightening. Like how involved it is to get a new book picked up. You know, it's like. I, I don't know if, 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 if this memory is clear to you from when you were younger, but I, I still remember vividly the idea as a kid that, oh, well, you just do really awesome work, and then Stanley's going to drive up in a car and say, yeah, you got the goods, kids, get it, get in. And then you just sit in a room all day and draw comics and don't worry about anything else. And then uh, the moment that your book is accepted, three weeks later it's in print, and now you're a superstar. Uh, one of the things that I'm walking away with after reading the blogging that you've been doing is just how involved and, I mean, it takes, what, two and a half, sometimes three years to make a graphic novel if you're the cartoonist, but how much decision-making process goes in on the front end to even get started on the darn thing. Yeah. Uh, and this isn't, I want to make sure that I, I characterize this correctly or as best I can, is that this isn't a, uh, a treatise on um, bureaucracy, this is showing how intentional every step of the way is, right? Definitely. Um, and, you know, we we talk a lot sometimes about, you know, we have so many meetings. Because I, I go to a whole lot of meetings every day. Um, you know, sometimes it's like, okay, I have an hour that I'm not having a meeting. And, you know, sometimes this is not great great because there's other work that needs to be done but sometimes it's really wonderful because what it is is a chance to sit down with all the other people at McMillan who are the support team from our book or the editorial team for our book or the design team and say like are we on track let's all weigh in and make sure that we're doing the right thing for the book that we're publishing so that you know when we do get that hour to sit down and, and do the work to get the book out there we have the best possible books. So, so how far ahead are you guys working then? That's a question that's actually in the chat here. Peter Palmiotti is asking, is like, how far ahead uh, is your business plan? How, how, I mean, because like with this acquisitions post that you did recently, you're talking about a pretty extens extended amount of time before the book even is acquired by the company. So what, what's yeah, the lead right time? Right now we have books acquired out through like 2016, 2017 that are on our schedule to be published then. Wow. Um, and last Monday we just outlined our whole schedule for the year 2014. Wow. So, I mean, you're finalizing things two years ahead of time then. Yeah, I mean, you know, those dates are always flexible and they are dependent on, you know, the people turning in their books, uh, which sometimes doesn't happen. And they're also dependent on, like, we may acquire foreign projects, which take a shorter time to do, or we may acquire something that's like a, a younger book that's a shorter book that will be done in that time period that we didn't expect. Um, but we we do need to know pretty far ahead of time what we're doing. Like um, this morning I sat down and wrote the first draft for the marketing plans for our fall 2013 books. Um, and we are in the middle of doing the final pricing and the, the catalog copy for our winter 2014 books this month. Wow. So, you know, where, where like our, our fall 14 projections are a little hazy, our, our fall 2013 books are basically already turned in or almost turned in at this point. So more evidence that comics is not a uh, career choice for the faint of heart or the easily distracted, right? Or the impatient. What's that? Or the impatient. Yeah, for sure. No, there's no question about that. So, okay, you, you went into this a little bit earlier, but, um, and, you know, okay, I... I'm here representing cartoonists. A lot of people who listen to the show are working cartoonists, and I know this question is being uh, wondered about, so I'll, I'll relay it on behalf of everybody. Um, what do you look? And you, you talked about this in one of your blog posts on the behind-the-scenes thing too. Is what are you looking for in a pitch? Not the the squishy ethereal stuff, but you know, I, I've had discussions with different people in the industry, and some people say, "Oh, well, you got to do a 14-page trailer." Uh, a preview scene from the book, one of the scenes that best exemplifies the tone and feeling of the book, and it should have a six-page uh, synopsis with character designs in there. I've talked with some agents in the past. I had actually a discussion with an agent uh, for a book that I finished, and I was showing it to her to see about getting representation, and she said, well, I need a, a typewritten manuscript. And I said, but it's a, it's a comic. 
And she said, yeah, I know, but I still need to see a typewritten manuscript before I'll even look at the comic. I'm like, the comic's right here. She's like, but I need to see a manuscript. So there's a lot of different uh, points of view and opinions on what a submission should look like. And even the traditional comic book companies, Marvel and DC, the traditional American superhero companies, they used to have very stringent guidelines of it has to be this size and this many pages and feature these characters doing this stuff. Uh, is there something, is there like a format that you guys prefer to look at? Uh, there is not. We have the extremely unspecific guidelines of uh, people should submit us something that's a representative of the entire book. So for some people, that's the entire book. Uh, for some people, that's uh, some character uh, character sketches and a page long description of what the book is. Wow. It it really it really varies very wild, widely. You know, um, and I, I talked a little on my blog about like good ways to submit things to us, and the reason that this varies widely is that people submit us all sorts of different things. They submit us things that are in line with work they've done before. They submit us, you know, totally new projects from totally new authors. They submit us things that are not in line with things they've done before. And if if you're an author who you know has a specific MO, like say you are, are Jane Yolen, who, who we've done a book with. We did a book with her called Foiled, but we have illustrations by Mike Cavallaro. And it's really great. And it is a older middle grade, younger teen fantasy novel. And so being Jane Yolen submitting to us being like, dear for a second, I'm submitting you a fantasy novel. And we're like, oh, Jane Yolen. You know, like I bet she can write a fantasy novel. Yeah. Based on her, her previous, you know, right. Todd Awards, Hans Christian Andersen's Awards. We've read her book. Like I read her books in, in school when I was a kid. You know, we kind of get, you know, she sends us a, a plot and we're like, okay, we're, we seem like, we think that that seems like a good plot. We have an illustration idea. Like, you know, we'd like to work with you. Whereas if, you know, someone who has never done a comic before in their life, who's going to school at CCS or SCAD or SVA, and is like, okay, I'd like to write a, you know, middle grade, younger teen fantasy novel, we're like, I think we need to see more of this book than just that sentence. You know, we need to see what your art looks like. We need to see what your story looks like. We need to see how your dialogue works works we need to see all of that stuff because we don't have the background on you and your publication history to be able to say you know definitely we we need all the middle grade fantasy novels possible right so have you ever is has there ever been a book that got picked up uh or acquired based on a uh series of rough of, of sketches and notes uh where it wasn't here's like finished art um, I mean, I'm sure that's how I don't. Yeah, I, I know. So I, this is unfair. Yeah, you're marketing in the marketing department, but so I, I do not so much. Um, I don't acquire the books. I don't re I'm not the first line of defense in, in acquiring books. And there are a whole lot of books that we've acquired that, you know, I hear about when we're acquiring them, you know, the week, the week that we're like, okay, let's do this. Um, uh, you know, we, we formalized our acquiring process a whole lot since we started in 2006. It used to be a whole lot more informal than um, the process that I talk about on our blog. Um, but I do think that the new process has a lot of good checks and balances and a lot of chance for p other people at Macmillan to, to weigh in with their opinions about what we're doing. So I think that's very valuable. Um, I was trying to think about things that we've published that, that we've only seen sketches for. Well, you know, I'm sure that there's there's a book like that. Yeah, you know, I mean, like I, I can I can 100 percent guarantee you that there is a book like that that we have published without, you know, naming names because I can't think of one off the top of my head. Well, you guys do a lot of books. And plus, like you, you pointed out, you're in the marketing department. You're not in the editorial department. So it, it's not not terribly important that we get an ex actual example of this. But what I, what this is uh, sparking in my mind is, is an interesting food for thought and this is this is my last squishy question i promise okay. um you talk about 
we either need to know, you know, what's the publication history, where does it fit in on the bookshelf, who is who is the audience for this thing. But then, you know, one of the the, the overriding themes of of the the, pub, the books that you publish, as well as what we've been talking about today, is is it good? Yeah. Uh, can you even try to define what does it mean to be first, second good? Because you know, there's like when you think of like fanographics, when you think of IDW, when you think of uh, oh Scholastic for that matter, you know, there's there's like a, a general feel of well, oh, this book would be a good book for Scholastic, or this book would be a good book for fanographics, right? Uh, is this a discussion that even happens in the offices, or is this something that's like it's from the gut? No, this is something we talk about all the time, actually, um, because there are definitely books that we're like, you know, this is a really great book and someone else should publish it. Yeah, okay. Um, so there, there are a few different factors that we take into account here. So when for a second was founded by our editorial director, Mark Siegel, it was specifically founded by Mike McMillan. We didn't start as an independent company. We started as the graphic novel imprint of the book publisher. And the reason that... Macmillan was willing to invest in this is because they thought graphic novels had potential. They're being picked up in bookstores. More people were reading them. But what they wanted was a publisher who, an imprint, a graphic novel imprint, who published graphic novel stories that would reach the book market, that wouldn't just be able to be sold in comic stores or to comic fans, but who would reach readers who read books. So one of the first things we're looking or is a story that is accessible beyond a comics audience. Uh, so there's something like, I just read uh, the new Sammy Harkin collection that Picture Box published. And, you know, Sammy Harkin's work is really great. He's super talented. But that is definitely a piece of, uh, of literature that's for a comics connoisseur. It's not for someone who goes into a bookstore and says, like, I'd like a good book to read. And so that's not, that's not ever something that we would publish, despite it, it being, like, a lovely piece of work. Um, we, we definitely look at um, story and art that's specifically accessible to people who are not necessarily first-time comics readers. Um, and I think a lot of formalism is cool. Like, I love some of the stuff that Kevin Hazenga does. Stuff that is is specifically like for experiments in the form is not what we focus on because we're trying to do like, you know accessible story based books. So things that are you know fiction, nonfiction, um, science fiction, fantasy, and we deviate a little from this in that like sometimes we publish a comics textbook or something like that. Um, so the the general accessibility to an audience of non-sophisticated comics readers is something we look for as one of our primary um, endeavors. A good story, you know, that, you know, story, story is the most important thing for us. Um, with, with really good art, that's the next thing that we look for. And then the last thing that we look for is kind of a less tangible thing. Um, our, our, one of our the things that we used to say about for a second is that um, we publish comics with heart, and it's not a very tangible characteristic, but I think it can be um, embodied by um, reading something like Leica by Nick Abadzis or Robot Dreams by Sarah Varon, both of which are just kind of filled with with heart. Yeah. But basically, it kind of translates to a book that you know after you read it, you want to keep it, you want to put it on your bookshelf, you want to read it again. It it strikes a chord in you as a reader. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of the X factor of trying to submit books to first and second. Yeah, and, and when you say something like like with heart, that's such a an oily word to use. Oily in terms of like slippery, right? Uh, because one could easily misunderstand it to mean like, oh, you're talking about you got to write lifetime original films where there's like a tearjerker moment in it, right? And like, no, and, or, oh, you mean heart is in there's like, you can, you can really feel the author's passion behind it. Well, kind of, but it's like some kind of weird mix of, of both of those things, right? Where it's, it's emotionally effective and you can tell if the author was sincere. Uh, sincerity, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but y you know it when you see it, right? Yeah. Uh, 
and I mean the other the other factor here is that we we don't like books that um, the author and illustrator if there's a you know if there's a team are really dedicated to doing because yeah as we've talked about it it sometimes takes three years to publish a book and if you're doing this because you know you're not really interested in the story but you'd like to make some money you didn't have anything else to do that's going to be less appealing to us than someone who we're going to be like you are excited every day of the three years that we're working with you because we have to be excited every day of the three years that we're working for you <laughs> and make this book together. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've met my share of people at conventions and in my classrooms who approach it with the attitude of, Hey, I like to draw. I like comics. Heck I'll make comics. You know, like, Oh, Oh honey, it's going to be a lot harder than that. You, you, you won't stick with it with that attitude. Right. Uh, it's not for the Cavalier, as we were talking about earlier, right? So, so yeah, uh, a sense of passion about the project, too, and not just like, oh, this has got a hook, this has got some legs to it, I can find an audience for it. Uh, although economics is part of it, too, right, as people will find Definitely. in reading the blog, right? But we, we, we've got to spend some time talking about the Kickstarter post that you did because that was the one where I got, <laughs> this is the one where I read it and then like the same day I got emails from friends like, did you read this? Did you read this? <laughs> so this, this one sparked some attention from people. Um, the gist of it was, it, 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 you can correct me if I'm wrong, Gina, I'm going to try to summarize this, is that you posted the, the question like, hey, you know, Kickstarter's exciting, but, uh, you know, if you're going to go through all that trouble, why not try to get a publisher? Uh, because there's advantage, advantages to working with a publisher. Uh, and I, I think in some place in the article you talked about, I see all these great books being produced on Kickstarter, and I wonder, oh gosh, why didn't they come to us first instead of going through all this hassle of... Now, here's where I'm going to be... The I'm hassle I'm talking about is not like putting your, your project up on Kickstarter. The hassle I'm talking about is, you know having to do like the printing and the pricing and the distribution of your book all by yourself instead of working with a publisher. Okay. So yeah, There's let's look at a amount of hassle. I have, I have had one brief flirtation with Kickstarter and not to produce a creative project, but I have heard from many friends who have had successful Kickstarters that the work comes in with fulfilling pledges producing the darn thing like yeah i got this big sack of money now to pay me for my time to make the thing but now i've got to do all of this extra work in terms of keeping in touch with the fan with with all the supporters uh delivering all of the pledge prizes and uh going through proofs with the printer and you know going through uh the distribution channels now i've got all these books where do i put them besides in the hands of the people who pledge this thing so is that the case that you were making? I think I think that's what you just said, right? Is that uh, yeah. so, you know all, all that part like promoting and printing and distributing a book is the part that a publisher is kind of set up to do. Um, and so I think Kickstarter is great. I think it it does a lot of things really well. Um, I think it is a a good channel for people who are doing short work to get you know exciting new. Um, you know, short stories, short comics, art books, all that sort of stuff out, out to readers. I think that if you're kickstarting a project that you're going to take a lot of time to work on after the Kickstarter is over, like if you're going to be like, okay, this three-year graphic novel, year one, Kickstarter, um, the, how the the book gets to fit the fans that you make in the next three years of creating your graphic novel is the part that I think that maybe a publisher could have helped with us in a, a different way than Kickstarter is helping you. How so specifically? Could you go into like a specific thing that you uh, think a publisher has a, 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 an advantage over uh, doing it yourself? Yeah. Well, the first thing is that, you know, you do have that, editorial design marketing support team at your publisher. So, you know, instead of spending the next two years in, in your house making your graphic novel, you have a person who you can email every week and say, you know, I have some questions about this. Is this character isn't really working out? Do you have any thoughts? Like, how can I make this a better book? Um, and then the second, the second part of that is just uh, distribution, where 
a publisher is set up to distribute books. That's that's kind of the point of publishers. Like you have content, it comes in, and at the then what happens is that books come out at the end. Um, and as we're part of Macmillan, we have a whole team of people who do nothing but sell our books all the time. And what they they do that to uh, get the most people that they can interested in the books. And it's you know it's not just me sitting here. It's our entire our sales team, which is another like 50 people who work for Macmillan. And one person isn't going to have all those resources and they're not going to have the connections that we have with places like Barnes and Noble with independent bookstores all over the country, as well as, you know, comic stores and schools and libraries and all of those places where, you know, not only are we able to be like, okay, there's an ISBN on this book and you should buy it. We're able to say, you know, you have an account with us that is, you know, has the um, the credit information and stuff, and you work with us regularly, and so like you're already set up to buy books from us. All you have to do is press that button, and then there's no hassle involved for you. Right. That actually. Remi- and, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, and Gina. Structure and the infrastructure to get them all that information. That reminds which me. Which is structure. And, and, and which reminds me of the blog post you did on, which is another one that was just really uh, enlightening, was the Scholastic Book Fairs uh, yeah. post that you did where it was revealed that, you know, there's this thing called Scholastic Book Fairs. Many of us in the United States or possibly North America uh, remember being in elementary school and suddenly there was a big book sale in the cafeteria or in the library and that all these That's books were awesome. Oh yeah, it was. It was. Everybody looks forward to. It. And then I was telling some friends about this because after reading your post, I was talking with some friends about that very thing. Like, hey, remember the Scholastic Book Fairs? I'm like, what was that? And I say, remember they had the library and a bunch of books with it. And they're like, oh yeah, that was awesome. So yeah, we all remember it. Uh, and man, what a dynamite marketing opportunity for a book because you got this. Basically, you're turning a bunch of schools into stores to put it in crass terms, right? Uh, t- because you're talking about every school in uh, you know, the United States or North America, you've got a lot of different cultures that you're speaking to, and there's going to be books that play well in San Francisco and New York City, but not so well in, say, Tyler, Texas, right? So uh, th- that, that informs, and this was what was really like the light bulb moment for me, is like that, the, the, the d- different demographics and local cultures informs what books actually make it into this giant marketing engine. Um, so there's the point is that you know it's like going back to that romanticized idea that I had as a child about what it'd be like to be a cartoonist. There's this romantic ideal of I'm just going to write a story with vision and I'll find a publisher and then just like in the end of The Ghost in Mrs. Muir, I'm just going to be able to sit in my cottage and think about how wonderful my life is because my publisher is just taking care of everything. There are so many different dynamics at play on this and yeah, Kickstarter allows us to take that on ourselves, <laughs> which is awesome. Uh, you know, there's been some great success stories with like, what was it, Order to the Stick, uh, that webcomic made like a million or so bucks, but then, you know, he he actually posted the the math on how much was actually going to cost. It was like $200,000 or more to fulfill all of the pledge uh, mm-hmm. prizes, right? So like, it, it, the math uh, suddenly paints a completely different picture than that fantastic number of a million dollars, but... But also, but even if you do go with publisher, there's still a lot of dynamics at work that I think is really interesting uh, and, and worth considering for cartoonists. And that's why I think any cartoonist who is interested in the publishing world needs to read your blog, uh, just to give another plug for it. But uh, Peter Palmiotti is asking another question in the chat. Um, would for a second be willing to publish a superhero graphic novel? You have, haven't you? Uh, a kind of superhero graphic novel? Um, we published this book called City of Spies, which had a superhero character in it. Um, and there was a there was a girl and her dad, and they together they fought Nazis basically. Um, and then there was a rousing ending that involved lots of baking. So that was good. That was a good time. Um, and then we, we published stuff like like Richard Sell's Kepler Burglar Black, which involves a girl dressing up in a cat suit and breaking into people's houses to find like secret hidden treasure and stuff like that. Um, I mean, it really depends on what someone means when they say a superhero graphic novel. Like, what if it means like you know something like Andy Watson's Love Fights? then sure if it means like this is like thinly disguised superman batman story that's probably not gonna 
be so much our thing. Or here's my convoluted continuity world that I'm creating to build a franchise upon. Uh, I can't see that fitting into what for a second does either, right? We, uh, we are really about publishing books that have a beginning and they have an ending and they are satisfying to read as a whole. And we do do some things that are, you know, have multiple volumes, yeah. but we like them to be satisfying in themselves. And as we said, it takes, you know, at like the smallest amount of time it's taken someone to make a book for us is like a year and a half, which means that you won't be getting the next issue or you know, your next fix of that superhero comic for another year and a half. And so we have to take that into account when we're talking about serious publication. And the, the, the other answer to that that I would think would be appropriate is uh, there's other publishers if you want to do the sort of galaxy spanning multi-universe uh kind of like laden with continuity superhero story right uh although you know i i would also say that like if that's what you're aiming for possibly the market might be a little saturated with that right now although i think there's an opportunity to do it uh i, I think there's an opportunity to do something that's um more appropriate to kids with that kind of stuff like i think of uh uh Chris Russo's G-Man, which is a fantastic superhero comic. Um, but anyway, yeah, yeah. It's, I think that that's, that that's an important thing to understand is that there's more than one publisher in the world, and uh, I don't think for a second needs to do superheroes. But if you guys did, I imagine it would have, like you pointed out, like a, a very distinct flavor to it. Um, so we're coming up on uh, the book recommendation segment in a few minutes here. Is, oh, Aaron's not here yet? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. We can just keep going because I got tons and tons of notes here. Uh, and, and I got questions in the chat. How do you promote a literary comic towards bookstores? How did you start to build your relationship with retailers? That came in with Macmillan, didn't it? Or was there another way that you, you worked on that, Gina? Yeah, well, okay. So there's a good example in that we have a book that came out yesterday that's called Sailor Twain. That is an 18th century steamboat love story with slightly magical elements. Um, and it's about someone dealing with the midlife crisis and romance and all this sort of crazy midlife stuff that's going on. And it's 400 pages long. It's black and white. It's a bookstore book, basically. Um, so what we did to promote that book was a whole lot of different things. But the first thing that we did was we got the author to go to this show called BEA, which is called Book Expo America. And that is the show that bookstores, booksellers across the, com the country come to New York and they all get in the same room of the Javits Center to see what's going on with upcoming stuff. So we got the author to come speak about graphic novels, we got him to do an author stage there, and we did a whole lunch with him and a lot of booksellers. Um, and booksellers were like, this book sounds interesting, we would like to hear more of it. So we, we put the galley up online, we sent it out to a lot of booksellers stores. We also have a sales team of uh, sales reps who go all around the country to talk to bookstores individually one-on-one -on -one, and we gave them all um, excerpts of the book. We made the PDF available to them as well. So they went to all these stores and they said, hey guys, there's this book. It looks really good. It looks like it would be great for bookstores. You, you guys should you know, take a look at it and possibly buy it in for your store. Um, so that happen. And then we also have reps who deal with places like Amazon and BNN, and they also were like, okay, you know, Amazon, BNN, we think this is going to be really a you know book-friendly book. We also have a list of booksellers that you know talk to us about events, about catalogs, just saying like, hey, for a second, we like the stuff we do. We want information from you. So we send them catalogs, and we also send them digital catalogs and um, links to the PDF to say, hey, guys, this is coming up, you should buy all of these things. Um, you know, focusing on, you know, this is a title that's really literary, it's, it's good for you and your audience. Um, so after we did that, we, we got some event re requests in. Um, Mark, who is the author of Sailor Twain, is going to be doing events. And he's like, he got like 10 to 15 events over the next 20 days that he's doing. And some of them are at comics places, and so, like New York Comic Con is definitely a place where we're featuring that book. But he's also going to a lot of very literary bookstores to do things like readings and signings and um, Q and A's. He's got an exhibit going at the New York Public Library as well, so that's a big part of this. 
Um, oh, wow. He was on WNPR yesterday to talk about his book. And I mean, that's the, really the next piece is the, the publicity, where we have all sorts of contact lists that, that we have um, made up since we started up in 2006. And the, the media that promotes books for comics is different than the media that promotes books for kids or the media that promotes books for book readers, for literary readers. And we have lists of all these different people. And, you know, we sent out the book to the ones that we thought would be interested, it, which includes the comics and entertainment me media, but not so much, for example, the kids media. Uh, but then also places like, you know, the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, like all of those places. And we're like, hey, this is a book that we think should be on your radar. Um, so we, we do kind of all that stuff. And for every book that we publish, we really make a, a unique plan based on what kind of book the book is. And, so, and, and does, the, does the length of this plan, like the, the front ending of this plan, vary by project? Or is it a pretty consistent, like, well, we, we spend this many months or this much time before we kick into it? Um, we, we start all of the marketing plans at the same time because the start of them is um, a discussion about the entire season with our publisher and with our sales department about what we want to do for marketing and for the publishing plan for the books. Um, so that may mean that there's pieces for specific things that fall into place after that sooner than for other books. But for everything, it's you know like the beginning of this month, the first, the first week of September, we had the initial presentation of books to marketing and sales for our fall 13 list. So everything happens about 12 months out. Before we started recording the show, we were talking briefly about how part of your job is to negotiate travel for authors. And as I've gotten to know Dave Roman and Marina Telgemeier over the last couple of years, one of the things that I've watched with them is a lot of their time is spent traveling. Uh, and that's a big part of the, the cycle of a book, too, in, in this market, right, is uh, is you work for a couple of years in the book and then the promotion kicks in when the book comes out, the book is released and then you go on a big tour all over the place, uh, promoting the darn thing. And that's, and that's another advantage that you guys bring or an affordance that you guys bring to this too, is that you actually can help with that. Right. Yeah. And sometimes, I mean, we definitely do help with travel when we're sending our authors on tour. The tour is not a thing that every author should do for all of their books. Um, for kids authors, it, tour, it, touring is a, a better idea than adult authors because school visits can be set up and authors can go talk to schools and it doesn't matter if um, the, you know, like 50 people come to your bookstore event in the evening if you're, you're guaranteed that you're talking to 100 kids during the day. Uh, but for adult and literary authors, events are a lot more difficult because you have to get the people to come to the evening event who are not like obligated to be there by law or else like their parents are, you know, hunted down by social services. Um, <laughs> so I mean, for doing a tour for someone like Raina or, um, you know, we have had some authors that we've done school events like Ben Hackey, who did Z to the Space Girl. That, that's a whole lot easier than sending a very literary author on tour, unless your literary author is like, you know, the Hernandez brothers or like Neil Gaiman or something like that, because they're going to have people at all of their events. Um, mm -hmm. But when we decide to send people on tour, it tends to be for a very specific reason. So the, the last tour that we did was for the guys who did the book, The Silence of Our Friends. And the reason we did that tour is we said, you know, this book has a real literary bookseller market potential, and it has a school visit opportunity where you can go and talk to schools during Black History Month when the book comes out about like prejudice and Black history and all of that. And you can get all these things done and go to places that we have a very intense political climate places like D.C. and places like Texas, where this book is set, where none of you live. And we won't get that market unless you like, actually go to Texas. We won't get the media there. We won't get the school attention there. And you know, so maybe that's a thing they should do. Maybe you should, you should take a look at uh, reaching some more people through like, actually physically going to see them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one last thing that I we're gonna kick into book recommendations. Aaron is here. Aaron Helmrich is in the building. Good to see you, Aaron. 
Oh, is Aaron's mic on? Now it is. Hey. Hey there. Uh, I had one more thing that I wanted to mention about what you guys have been doing on the first second site that I think is really exciting, Gina, uh, is the online serials. Uh, we yes, talked we do online serials some of the time. So, um, so why are you giving it away? Nobody's going to buy the book then. Well, we do online serials for a number of different reasons. And one of the se recent serials we did was for this book, Sailor Twain, that I was just talking about. And the reason we did that was because we had this book, and it was a literary adult book, and the author before had only done children's picture books. And he hadn't ever done something that was marketed to the comics or entertainment audience at all. Mm -hmm. He'd only done stuff that was for really young kids. And we were like, somehow people need to learn about this book, and they need to learn about you as an author. Maybe the best way to go about this is the internet, is you know, making yourself a constant presence for two years, then at that point, people will be like, okay, like, I think that you are a person that I recognize and want to believe in as an author. Right. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you did this with um, Friends with Boys by Faith Erin Hicks. Uh, and now there's a new book, Nothing Can Possibly Go Wrong dot com is the one of the latest ones by Prudence Shen and Faith Erin Hicks. So, again, Faith. It's awesome. It looks really good. But I mean, it's like it's like the whole uh, you know it's 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 refreshing to see uh, somebody in the traditional book publishing world doing this kind of thing because this was the kind of stuff that five years ago everybody was screaming bloody murder about is like don't give it away don't don't release PDFs people will just steal it they'll never spend a penny on on uh, my stuff again to which my response was is when I'm at a convention people are picking up the book and flipping through the whole thing or even reading it cover to cover and putting it down not buying it should i charge them a dime for that read or when i go to the bookstore they let you browse the darn things it was only in the comic book store where they would at least the ones i went to not not vault of midnight they're a great store but uh but you go in and they have it in a plastic bag you know and they don't take it out of the plastic <laughs> bag buy it sight unseen I'm like really so yeah, it, it's it's nice to see you know somebody leading the way to like yeah you know there's a value to letting people see it up front right no, I mean, we do take the comics down from the internet after we have published them in print so people can um, <laughs> read them beforehand or they can read them in a book afterwards. But, the, I mean, this is just what the the success of uh, Avatar Last Airbender, or rather Avatar Legend of Korra did with having their, like, you know, giving away the, the, the episodes for free on the website and then trying to build hype around the Tumblr site. Uh, letting the fans enjoy it in the build-up to the release of the thing, right? So release it as an online serial, let the people get behind it, get excited about it, have a blog for the author to participate with, and then, yeah, you can take it down when the book comes out because now it's time to support the author, right? But it doesn't hurt to at least give it away for part of the time, right? That's, that's the part that excites me. Um, yeah, um, and we are excited by it, too. And it's, it's been a strategy that has worked well for us with the comics that we've been publishing oh good so far. that's good to, good to hear so so friends with boys benefited from doing that yeah it it has sold well and it, it reviewed really well and i think faith has definitely increased her online audience through publishing that book online and just gotten more attention for her the rest of her books and her future work which is great um the the previous book we did as a serial zara's paradise um went on to be a new york times bestseller. Wow, that's great. That is really, really encouraging to hear. I hope more publishers follow this example. I think that, I think it's absolutely fantastic. So, um, any final thoughts that you wanted to throw? Any, anything that you wanted to promote about the First Second Site uh, before we kick into book recommendations, uh, Gina? Yeah, I think the First Second Site is pretty decent at speaking for itself. <laughs> uh, people want to check it out. That's at firstsecondbooks.com. Okay, so then we will promote some books now and talk about some books. So Aaron Helmrich of comics.aadl.org, aadl.org. Hey, how's Star Wars? Uh, how did Star Wars Week go? Well, Star Wars Reads Day is a Saturday. Oh, it's the so Saturday. hopefully people will still come out. It's 1 to 5 this Saturday downtown. That's right. We're going to have a free photo booth. So if you're dressed up, we've got props too, so you can get pictures taken. Um, we're going to have 501st and different people dressed up as stormtroopers. I saw, I saw and stuff. Bo Boba Fett was in the building yes. today because Eric, Eric Closter, yeah, Boba's EJK on the here, Twitter is and here. so is um, Darth Vader and C3PO <laughs> and Yoda are all up on the third floor right now. <laughs> They're awesome. just waiting. So that's this Saturday at yes. the downtown yes. uh, Ann Arbor District Library. So come on out for it. So um, what do you got to talk about? My first book, um, I don't know if you've seen this yet. I, I loved it. It's called The Tale of Pawn Life. 
called Mr. Big. And it's a gorgeous book. It's do- it's in a, you know, kind of a different style, a lot more um, spare. But it, it's a story and a narrative, but also has lots of information about, you know, predator and prey and, you know, so pond life in general. It's so you're life learn. Uh, in a pond. Yes, you're going to learn. So the story is Mr. Big is a snapping turtle. Okay. Who... Um, a lot of the animals in the pond want to get rid of him, and they decide that they're going to get into um, cooperation here with the crows, get the murder of crows to get involved. Um, But the interesting twist is that there's an invasive species that comes into the pond that may even be worse than Mr. Big, and that's one of these um, Chinese snakehead fish that they've got big problems with over on the East Coast. Actually, this is one of my favorite parts. The only indicator until the back when it tells you that this fish might be from somewhere else is, is that his it, thought bubble is in a different um, language. Is in kanji. So, oh, wow. Um, but it's, it's, an, it's a neat story. It's, it's, you know, you'll learn a lot about nature and whatnot, but there is a nice statement in the back um, by a zookeeper talking about why it's important to have the top of the, the predator chain in a small, sp- you know, pond life like that. So Mr. Big... By Tale Carol, Carol Dembicki and Carol Matt and Dembicki. Matt Dembicki yeah. yeah. Okay. And then I also grabbed just uh, for the beloved fans, um, "Wrinkle in Time" has now been made into Hope a graphic novel. Larson, a Wrinkle in Time. It's the 50th anniversary of a Wrinkle in Time this year. Um, so there's all sorts of yeah. special presentations, including this graphic novel, and then there's this like crazy slipcase edition. Uh, FS. G, who published this, is our sister company. Ah, so, okay. Uh, see, get our calls all the time. Okay. It looks great. Wow. I like the. I've, I found the, the the coloring and the and the shading to be interesting too. Just the yeah, whole the, the blue the and the black tones. Yeah. Just blue and black are the two ink colors on this. And it's and pretty thick. So I, you know, I haven't read it yet myself. So I don't know how completely faithful it is, but I it's think it looks faithful. pretty faithful. It, is it pretty close to the original text, it Gina? It's extremely close to the original text. Wow. Well, and plus Hope Larson stuff is just, it's, who doesn't like looking yeah. at Hope Larson's artwork? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's its going to be gorgeous on top of everything else. It looks great. And I it's am, been sitting on my desk for a day and everyone walks by, oh my God, I didn't know that was, <laughs> they did that. So, um, definitely one that a lot of people will be interested in. And then this is a newer um, s- character, Leo, but this is the 2012 edition. There's been some previous stories. Um, it's a wordless comic, which is always, you know, a different challenge to do. Sort of like, um, you know, zombies and monsters. And he has a, a father who um, I get the impression that he might be a little bit like Calvin and Hobbes' dad, where he's always dealing with little Leo. And the art that style he's doing. reminds yeah. me of like 80s kid lit art, like, like the kind of art you'd see in like Hot Dog Magazine in the 80s. Yeah. I love it. And the oval eyes is always kind of interesting, that, old, that little orphan Annie look. Yeah, yeah, but with the squiggly line, uh, the squiggly line style on the panel borders and on the character designs. So who did this? Who this one is by um, Mark, Mark Tatuli. Tatuli. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but. No, no, this is new to me. So mo- there's a monster in my socks, Leo. So this one's 2012, but um, there's a couple of previous and this is collections of that character by Andrews McMeal Publishing. Yeah. Okay, yeah, they're doing a whole bunch of interesting comic stuff lately. So th- this and is then amp comics for kids. I everybody. didn't plan it, but I also grabbed <laughs> um, Sailor, Sailor Twain. Sailor Twain, which um, looked looks awesome, and I think it's already got a waiting list. This is just waiting to be processed. Does um, it really have a waiting list at the library? That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the greatest thing about the fact that we put up our new graphic novel list so people can kind of see what's on order and then it gets hot before it even makes it to the shelf. The interesting thing to me is it's got such a um, lush cover and then the artwork is pretty surprising inside, sort of soft, soft pencil, pencil. Yeah, it's all done in charcoal. Oh, so okay. the original pages are like, are they're some crazy amount of bigness. They're like 20 inches tall wow, or something like that. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, I, Mark basically had to just spray them all the frame out before he brought them in to scan wow. because you can't really take charcoal pages that are 20 inches tall from <laughs> Cherrytown to New York City without getting a smudge mess at the end. 
So we're, we're all glad he does not seem to have um, brain damage from all that, that uh, spray map. Wow. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a little tip from the Comics Are Great show is if you're using workable fixative kids, be in a ventilated area. That <laughs> stuff is serious, serious poisonous gas. So, yeah, I imagine if you're talking like 20-something inches wide, these are big pieces of art, yeah, and in charcoal, you definitely want to either use hairspray or fixative on them. I was also, I have to confess, con, um, impressed by the variety of the blurbs on the back from Rachel Maddow to John Irving. So <laughs> that's a pretty good endorsement. <laughs> so Sailor Twain by Mark Siegel from First Second Books. Yeah, it's... Uh, it, it's, it's a done deal. We already made a case at the top of this one that anything for first second is worth reading, but this one especially. So, And that'll be in the library's collection yeah, soon. Very soon. Where, where is this list again that you post? If you go to AADL.org and if uh -huh. you click on our catalog button, which is one of the biggest buttons there on the screen, underneath it are a series of lists that one of them is all the new stuff, one of them is the hot stuff, hot being determined by number of holds and people mm -hmm. wanting it. So there's a new list right underneath that just says new graphic novels and that we load those up the second that we order them. Oh, great. Okay. So people can, you know, look and see and get their holds on things before they make it to the shelf. Yeah, and with, with, <laughs> with the constituency of AADL, it doesn't surprise me that uh, a lot of the different stuff coming yes. in would have a ton of holds beforehand, not yeah. just the DVDs, yeah. you know, also the Oh, no, the, yeah. the books, too. Anytime yeah. anything shows up on NPR or... New York Times or, uh, you know, the standard places we get inundated. So. <laughs> so so Gina, did you have any books that you wanted to uh, make a mention of on uh, at, the, at the bottom of the show? Yeah, um, we've been talking a lot about Friends with Boys, and I do have that here. So I just wanted to hold up a copy because it's awesome. Um, so you should definitely look at that one. But I have two um, recent or upcoming books to talk about. One of them is Broxo by Zach Giolongo. And um, Zach is a great guy, and this book is a teen book that is full of barbarians who fight zombies uh, with the help of uh, large furry animals that are cute and uh, menacing at the same time. So it's a whole lot of fun, and people should definitely check this one out. So I haven't read Broxo yet, but going back to one of our earlier points about heart, because when you'd say barbarians fighting zombies with help from animals. Oh, man, that almost sounds like a high-concept pitch for Hollywood. That almost sounds like, oh, we'll get this demographic and that demographic. Uh, although so there's also a lot of family drama and a lot of uh, really intense world building. It's really about, as well as the barbarians who fight zombies, the barbarians are uh, consist of Broxo, who's this barbarian who lives alone on top of a mountain and where the ruins of his clan used to live. And this girl named Zora, who is a barbarian from a different clan, who comes in and is like, I want to find your clan because I'm a messenger from my clan. And then they investigate together the mystery of his clan's disappearance. And it's very emotional for both of them because, you know, the zombies come in in some way and they also keep chasing them around. So it's difficult for them to investigate because their investigation keeps getting thrown off by zombies trying to eat them. Um, but it's, just because something has, you know, orcs or zombies or aliens or something doesn't mean that it can't be a book that, that resonates with a reader. I mean, genre fiction is great. Like, mm -hmm. people should should write emotionally moving cowboys and superheroes and all of those things all the time. I, I really strongly believe in, you know, things being emotionally moving that are not literary fiction. Right. And I did almost bring Broxo up. Um, it's in the building on order and almost in an order. Oh, our cool, so. cool. Uh, that's great. No, I, I just, I, I think that the, the, the takeaway there, and I think this is a great takeaway for any working cartoonists who are listening in on this, is that there's a difference between the pitch you use to recommend a book to a friend and the pitch you use to get a publisher interested in your thing, right? Uh, is that when that's you. I mean, we do love zombies and barbarians and aliens and all of those things so like definitely it's decent to headline your pitch with like exciting zombie barbarian drama if if you so desire <laughs> all right i'll send you my pitch for indiana jones in space with zombies tonight uh you'll look for it in your inbox well, space uh, archaeology it sounds fascinating <laughs> all and right one more book i wanted to hold oh up yeah this book uh it's called sumo and it's by tin fam and this book comes out in December, and it's really wonderful. It's the story of a washed-up football player from Texas who ends up going to Japan to become a sumo wrestler. Oh, wow. 
And Tin Fam, I got to, I had the pleasure of uh, hanging out with him, uh, being like next door to him at the American Library Association conference. And that guy is a he's riot. Awesome. Yes. And so, you have him on your show. Oh yeah, no, he's on my list. He's on, he's he's on my short list of people who I absolutely need to have on the show because I think it'll be a riot just for people to watch him give me a hard time. Because yeah, well, he's he's a he's a very he's customer, so that would be excellent timing for him. What, what? him for marketing? I say as his marketer. <laughs> December, you say? December, I do say. All right, I he's will. He's also a high school teacher, so he can come at this with a, a multiple. A, a, a multiple disciplinary perspective yeah. sort of approach indeed uh, all right so december i will have to get tin fam on the show uh so yes uh sumo i will certainly read it level up was awesome uh and that's the one he did with uh gene yang so and plus he's just a really really funny guy so okay well gina thank you so much for making the time to be here today and sharing all these insights people can find you at firstsecondbooks.com in the behind the scenes blog and then where are you on twitter at zero one per second. And I, I have to say, I mean, I know I told you this at, at uh, this was at ALA, wasn't it? That, you know, you, I think, maintain one of the classiest presences on uh, on Twitter. Uh, I, I, we don't have to go into the whole story behind it, but there was just somebody who was being kind of a little bit on the obnoxious side. And, and Gina shut him down with all the grace and class of a Mr. Miyagi. I thought it was <laughs> terrific. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Pe people should follow zero one per second on Twitter. Um, and then anything else that you, any other places where you haunt that you wanted to point people at? That's pretty much it. Okay. Well, that's where they go. So, uh, Aaron, where can people find you? Just AADL.org? Yeah, still. And then AADL <laughs> on Twitter? And Twitter. And I maintain our Pinterest page at the oh. AADL. W what's the address for that? Um, I think it's AADL slash pins after Pinterest. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, but if you just, I think if you just Google Ann Arbor District Library and Pinterest, it'll come right it'll up. It'll come up. Okay. And then, yes, AADL on the Twitter. So, Thanks, everybody, for listening and watching. This episode will be archived at comicsaregreat.com slash CAG65. That's where you can get the audio and video. You can also get it on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash comicsaregreat. The show will be uh, broadcast again in two weeks, Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time at comicsaregreat.tv and on, uh, what is it, google.com slash plus Jersey Droz. Well, it'll all be in the show notes to the link that I threw out earlier. And uh, until then, uh, until next time, everybody, I have been Jersey Droz of Comics Great dot com and jersey on twitter okay bye